All right, <clears throat> let's uh, go ahead and start in prayer. Let's pray. Our eternal and gracious Father, thank you again for this time that we can learn. Even as we look at the life of Christ and the popularity that he had at the start, how it started to wane, uh, that we may know the kind of prophecies that were being fulfilled, uh, that he would be betrayed, that he would be rejected, uh, that um, those that would follow him initially uh, would be very small in number so that he would bear our sins. And we are thankful even unto you uh, for your love towards your son in sending him to die in order so that he may be glorified. And we thank you for your son who came to die uh, in expression of his love for you in obedience uh, to you, wanting to give you the glory. And even as we go through today's lesson uh, to look at various key events, may this glorious truth come forth to us and humble us that we may love our Savior even more so. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, we have uh, finished studying the great Galilean ministry of Christ, and that was about 18 months. Uh, his first preaching tour was about one year, and uh, the other two preaching tours took about took about six months. So we continue our study of the life of Christ by looking at his training of the 12. Now, what we will see is because he was uh, eventually not, his ministry was eventually not received by the great majority of the people, what he taught was so controversial that many left him. Uh, his disciples also were shaky in their faith. And he knew that he only had, you know, um, a year left in order to train them uh, before his crucifixion. And so he takes them apart uh, and he um, goes into lands where uh, there are traditionally and historically more um, uh, Gentile people. So he goes into the lands of Tyre and Sidon. And then thereafter, he will go to Decapolis. And uh, after Decapolis, uh, they return briefly to Galilee before going to Caesarea uh, Philippi. So uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, journey he takes his disciples on in order to train them. So, you know, he had spent these 18 months of public ministry. He taught publicly. Uh, both Jews and Gentiles, he demonstrated uh, miracles in order to authenticate uh, the gospel. But what had happened was, as we saw earlier on, uh, the Galilean ministry ended with unbelief. The Pharisees were against him. Uh, they said that he performed all of these miracles by the power of the devil. And uh, uh, even the majority of the people, his disciples who had followed him thus far, uh, they left following him after he told them that he was the bread of life and that they needed to consume him. They didn't understand these things, uh, but his disciples kind of did. You know, they had seen all of these miracles. They had heard his words, uh, these 12 apostles, and they continued to be steadfast with him. And so now uh, Jesus spends six months uh, in private ministry with them. Now, he didn't go to Judea because obviously the Pharisees, uh, who were stronger in that area, they were seeking to kill him. And they had already sent up representatives uh, from Jerusalem to try and catch him in his words. And so he continued to spend time in Galilee, uh, but especially in Gentile lands, because after all, the Jews were now rejecting Jesus. Um, the gospel had gone forth to them, uh, but they refused to understand. So 
Jesus often said that other sheep he had besides the ones in Israel. And this is where he took the opportunity to go forth into Gentile lands. And it was good training for the disciples because after all, uh, they would follow the pattern of his ministry. Remember, Jesus was baptized in the Judean region. He ministered in Jerusalem, but thereafter, you know, he went to Samaria, talked to the Samaritan woman. He went thereafter to Galilee, which was comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. And so he was preparing his disciples to go further, right? And this is the pattern of Acts 1.8, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So one of the reasons why he did not go to Judea, as I said, was because the religious Jews uh, they were trying to kill him. Uh, the Jewish leaders, they were angry with him ever since the first uh, Passover, uh, 18 months uh, before where he cleansed the temple. And so they had often sent people to try and find fault with his words. And furthermore, there was danger from Herod. You know, Herod had asked, is this uh, John the baptizer uh, reincarnated? You know, could it be him? Because Herod spent a lot of time already uh, and effort to get rid of uh, John uh, the baptizer, all right? And so there was a threat to his claim as king. And so the Herodians were also against Jesus. Now, what is important about this time of the training of the 12 is that until now, for two years, you know, six months initial Judean ministry, 18 months, great Galilean ministry, he never explicitly uh, foretold his death. He had, you know, here and there kind of said it, I'll give you the sign of Jonah, you know, but in what way did he mean it, you know, was never very explicit. But now he started to be very much more explicit to his disciples. He had to prepare them. And in one sense, you had people like uh, Simon the Zealot, you had Judas Iscariot, you know, these, and even, you know, all, actually all of them, they wanted to be like the prime minister. They, they wanted to be first in the kingdom. And so he really had to tell them that this kingdom was not physical, was not political, at least not immediately. And this disappointment would eventually get to Judas Iscariot so that he would betray Jesus. So these six months are quite vital to uh, reveal some of these things to his uh, apostles. So the purpose of the training of the 12 was really to prepare uh, them for his death, uh, subsequent resurrection, and then absence from him. Uh, now, whereas in the past, uh, he spoke in parables, and the reason why he did that was to hide truth from the people, and he also explained it very clearly to his apostles. Here, because it was private, it was mainly them. Yes, there were times when he spoke to the crowds, but this is when he spoke extra plainly uh, to them. And his strategy in the past, in the great Galilean ministry, was to go among the people through the cities, you know, where there were large crowds, uh, congregating around him so much so that his parents, uh, his, his brothers, his half-brothers and Mary could not get to him because of the press. Uh, now he took his disciples away from the crowds uh, to Gentile lands. And uh, one of those reasons is because uh, religious leaders uh, would not follow them there, right? The, it was too troublesome uh, to go there. If they traversed to Gentile lands, they would have to do ceremonial cleansing. And so it was in these regions also uh, that Jesus would seek solitude as he spent time with God. Now, as we come and take a look at the, at the training of the 12, uh, we, we see that towards the end as well, even as Jesus revealed some of these things to them, even though, you know, uh, they made remarkable confessions about Jesus, uh, in the end, they did not really get everything. They still continued to argue uh, who would be the greatest. So Jesus was telling them, I'm going to die. And they were still arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Uh, 
Now we take a look here when we talk about uh, the training of the 12, they went to uh, journey into pagan lands. And so here we see the uh, map of how they travel. So they went uh, to three pagan regions. They went to the region of Phoenicia, uh, Tyre and Sidon. And then thereafter, they went to the region of Decapolis. Uh, and then thereafter, they went to the region of uh, Caesarea uh, Philippi. All right, so these three regions, uh, which were more pagan in nature. So, uh, so uh, aside from these three uh, Gentile regions, there were two other regions that he uh, traversed through that were Jewish. He came back to Galilee, and he also traversed uh, to this area, the Trans uh, sorry, the, the Vale of Jezreel. Now, this is only conjecture. We're not exactly sure. All right, uh, we will go through it, and uh, you can perhaps make your own conclusions. All right. So he traveled first to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He came back. Then, secondly, he traveled to Decapolis, this region. He came back, all right, and then he went up to Caesarea Philippi, and then perhaps he went down here uh, to the Vale of Jezreel, and then came back to Galilee, okay? So the first place that Jesus took his apostles was to the region of uh, Phoenicia, to Tyre and Sidon, and the Bible does tell us that uh, he had a house there, uh, possibly rented. Uh, he did not want anyone to know where it was, but uh, his presence when he came to that region was already known. It was noised abroad. Now, if you recall, when Jesus was here in uh, uh, Galilee, there were people who came from everywhere. And you know, where they also came from was from Phoenicia. So now that he went to Phoenicia, uh, even though he desired to remain quasi anonymous, uh, his presence was uh, known quite quickly. And it was there, we're not sure whether it was in Sidon or Tyre, but it was around this region that there was a, this woman, a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, she wanted him to uh, cleanse uh, her daughter from an unclean spirit. And uh, this was a Hellenistic woman of Phoenician origins. You had uh, Jews, especially those of Galilee, who had adopted Hellenistic culture. So likewise, you had the Phoenicians who also adopted uh, Hellenistic or Greek culture. And what is amazing here is when she came to him, Jesus tested her. If you remember the account, he said, why should I give uh, that which is meant uh, for the children uh, unto dogs? And she said, you know, uh, even the dogs eat the crumbs. So here was a woman who accepted uh, the words of Jesus and humbled herself. And this really showed a great and vast difference. You know, Jesus had spent 18 months in the Galilean region, preaching the word, uh, demonstrating uh, goodness, uh, showing miracles. You know, the gospel, as we learn in Romans 1.8, uh, uh, Romans 1.16 is firstly for uh, the Jews, right? And thereafter for the Gentiles. But the Jews, you know, in those 18 months, they had rejected the bread that Jesus had brought. Right? Remember the bread of life, you must eat the bread of life. They had rejected him. And now this woman here was saying, I'm happy to take the crumbs. All right? So this is a lesson of humility where the people of God should have seen their Messiah. Uh, they didn't. But here was a woman uh, who was not of the commonwealth of Israel, but she saw Jesus for who he was and was willing to humble herself. You see, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this was very different, you know, from the reactions of the Jews and the Jewish leaders. You know, who she was, 
uh, you know, was like the Samaritan woman, someone outside of the Commonwealth of Israel, but brought in uh, through faith. So after Decapolis, you know, the Bible does not tell us uh, more uh, details except for that, right? But then thereafter, Jesus went into the region of the Decapolis. Now, this region here was a fairly large region. You know, in the past, I said we would not be visiting the Decapolis. Uh, I, 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 I was wrong, right? So when we go to Israel, there'll be uh, two cities, at least, that we will visit uh, that will be part of the region of the Decapolis. This is the Transjordanian region. And we see here the city in those days called Philadelphia. Now, this was not the Philadelphia uh, in the book of Revelation that is in uh, Turkey, right? That is in the region of Asia Minor. But this Philadelphia, same name, but this is a name that was given, the Roman name or the Greek name that was given to Ramot Amman, right? That is the historic city of Ammon, uh, one of the sons of Lot through one of his daughters, uh, the city of the Ammonites. And this is today the capital of uh, Jordan, Amman. And this is where we're flying to. All right, so we will be there. Uh, not that we will see very much, I believe, right, but at least we will be here. Uh, one city that we will not go to, we didn't have the time to put it in our itinerary, is Garasa or present day Jerash. All right, a very fascinating city. We won't be going there, but the city that we will be going to is uh, Scythopolis. Uh, uh, that's what it was called in those days, but the biblical name is Beit Shan. All right, this is where uh, King Saul and his sons, uh, their bodies were hung after they were killed, right? So anyway, Jesus came into this region uh, because it was uh, Gentile. And the reason why it's called Decapolis is because it was a region of 10 Roman cities. It was very much uh, uh, culturally, politically Roman and Greek. And so this is why uh, the, the, the Pharisees, the religious Jews, would never have come uh, to this region. There were Jews, of course, living in this area, but they were even considered more unclean uh, than the Jews that were in Galilee, right? So it was in this region that Jesus healed a deaf and a mute man, and this is where great crowds gathered. And Matthew 15, 31 records for us, you know, that they glorified the God of Israel. And, and this, is, um, this is amazing, because consider the backdrop. When Jesus did all of those miracles uh, in Galilee, uh, the Pharisees said he is in cahoots with the devil, right? But here outside of Israel, among the Gentiles, they could see very clearly uh, who Jesus was, and they glorified the God of Israel. And, and so this is a lesson, really, of faith, if we were to compare. You know, Jesus went to Samaria. Uh, he, the Samaritan woman demonstrated a faith that even the Jews in Jerusalem at the first Passover, they did not demonstrate. You know, then he went to Syrophoenicia and to Decapolis, and they demonstrated faith there where uh, the Jews and the religious leaders in Galilee uh, did not demonstrate. So we learn that it was in this region. Now, the Bible does not specify where it was, right? But here he taught a crowd, a great crowd for three days. The Bible tells us that they came from every region in the capitalist, and where they came to was like a desert region. And they and he taught them straight for three days. You know, their food had run out and, and whatnot. And there he feeds the 4,000. Now, you know, if you depends on who you read, uh, certain Bible scholars, liberal, you know, they will try and equate the feeding of the 5,000 with the feeding of the 4,000. But we see very clearly that they were separate events. All right? uh, one was in the Galilean region uh, to the Jews, uh, and the other 
uh, was in Decapolis to the Gentiles. And what we see is that he fed 4,000. I, I think the numbers are, uh, in, in that one sense, they're not significant, right? except to show the, the, the crowds that followed Jesus. I, I don't think there's any numerology here, right? any feng shui here uh, for us to examine. right? But what we do see is that the difference between the first feeding of the 5,000 in Galilee and the second feeding of the 4,000 in uh, Decapolis was not only the number, not only the, uh, uh, the recipients of the food, but the number of days uh, that they were willing to listen to Jesus, uh, the distance from which they came, right, and the circumstances so the Gentiles, right, from such a large region, 4,000 came. Now, this is quite significant because it was from such a large region, right? Now, if you get 5,000 from this region coming from nearby, uh, it's phenomenal, but it's nowhere, you know, like what we experience, you know, in the in Decapolis. Here, they stayed for one day and they were hungry. Here, they stayed for three days, bearing their hunger just to listen to Jesus. Whereas here, they came from nearby. Here, they came from far away. And what is significant is, in this small region, they were near to Bethsaida. There was food in Bethsaida. But uh, wherever they were here, the Bible tells us that they were far from food. And one of the reasons why we know that is because here the disciples say, uh, said, you know, shall we buy uh, 20 denarii worth of bread to feed them? So there was a possibility of feeding them, but there was no possibility here. So the miracle that Jesus performed here, not to say that it was greater, but it was to people who would have traditionally not listen, but they were hungry, right? So we, we see a great difference and we see the trajectory of Jesus' ministry. So after Decapolis, they return uh, to the, the, the Galilee region. They return by boat. So we're not sure uh, from where in the Decapolis they were. So, you know, somewhere around this region, but they took a boat to Magdala, right? And Again, right, just to stress, it shows the wealth, the significance of this city, uh, Magdala, which again tells us that Mary of Magdala uh, must not have been a, you know, a, a nobody. She was somebody. She was a rich woman, right, involved in commerce. And once they came here, you know, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were already waiting for him and they demanded a sign. So you see the great difference again. I think the gospel writers want us to see uh, the comparison, the context. Whereas Jesus came for his people, uh, we are told, right, uh, in the, the book of John, right, that they received him not. And that is why Jesus went for the world, right, uh, went for uh, the Gentiles. And here they received him. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the ones who should have known who he was, uh, they rejected him. And they asked for a sign from heaven the third time as if the other signs were insufficient. So it was in this passage that Jesus said, you know, you know how to predict the weather, but you refuse to interpret the signs of the kingdom correctly. And so Jesus uh, and his disciples, they leave uh, that place by boat to the other side. So it tells us that they came from here to the Magdala, and I didn't uh, draw it here, but they went from Magdala probably somewhere uh, to Bethsaida, because that's probably his next stop, all right? And it was at this point in time that Jesus warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. I think this is important. Um, the, the, the illustration of leaven, when Jesus uses it, uh, is used either for, uh, to, to talk about bad things or talk about good things. So depending on the context, for example, Jesus uses the word leaven to speak about, um, 
uh, the kingdom of God, that it will grow just like a mustard seed or just like a, a new wine in the old wine skins. There's a fermentation. So that's in a good way. But here Jesus was specifically warning his disciples, his apostles, against the leaven of the Pharisees. And, you know, they've been with Jesus for such a long time. They should have understood by now uh, the parables, you know, the illustrations that he was using, uh, but they misunderstood. So this was the training of the 12, but they were not very good students, right? And so he rebuked them, you know, that they did not understand that he was speaking about the leaven of the Pharisees. And really, this was a worrying sign. Were they prepared for his departure? You know, and what is unfortunate is uh, throughout this whole event, they continue to be very divisive. Now, they crossed over to the other side, and the place that they went to with was Bethsaida. And there he healed a blind man who saw clearly. Now, this is uh, important because uh, this is the irony, right? It is sandwiched here between Jesus in Magdala speaking to the Pharisees. Right? Then this happened. And this is where they went up uh, north to Caesarea Philippi. And this is where uh, Peter himself, that's when he, when he was told about Jesus' death, uh, he, he said, no way, you know, this is not going to happen to you. What is interesting is the blind man in Bethsaida uh, saw he was healed. He gained back his sight. But here in Magdala, the Pharisees were blind. You know, uh, at, above here in the map, uh, Peter, he refused to understand uh, and accept uh, the death of Christ. So anyway, this is where we go next. Uh, you know, from Bethsaida all the way to Caesarea Philippi. And this region, this region of the Hula Basin, all right, uh, of the city of Dan, Caesarea Philippi, it's uh, the backdrop of which is Mount Hermon, this huge uh, mountain, the highest mountain in, in Israel. And, you know, um, this mountain is spoken of in Psalm uh, 133, to speak about how the dew of Hermon uh, waters Mount Zion, right? So it's a very high mountain, uh, and even during summer, it is still snow-capped. Uh, so when we go there, I think this is generally what we will be seeing. Um, uh, and uh, it's a spectacular region because this was also a Gentile region. And the cities over here... Um, uh, had a lot of pagan influences. So when we visit Dan, when we visit Caesarea, uh, we will see some of these things. Now, what is the significance of Caesarea Philippi? Uh, it was a place that symbolized the uh, pursuits of man, the worldly pursuits of man. Uh, this city was called Caesarea Philippi uh, because it was built by Herod the Great and thereafter by his son, Philip, in order to, um, to honor uh, Octavian Caesar, right? And it was in this region that Herod had built a great temple uh, for the worship of uh, Caesar. And, and this, is, uh, this is interesting because Herod built uh, the temple in Jerusalem. He renovated it. Uh, and we see such a man, he wanted to have the best of both worlds. Uh, he wanted to get in good with the Jews, and here he wanted to get in good with the Romans. His, his two feet were in two boats. You know, you can't serve God and mammon, but that's exactly what Herod uh, the Great did. So he built three temples in honor of uh, Caesar Augustus. Uh, the other two were in Caesarea Maritima, where we will also be visiting, and he also built it in Samaria. Now, uh, it not only symbolized the worldliness of man's pursuits, it also symbolized uh, and demonstrated the allure of paganism and religious syncretism. 
Now we all remember, hopefully, from our uh, you know study of of uh, Old Testament uh, survey about Dan. Uh, this was a nearby city. Uh, this was previously the the city called Laish, where Abraham went to 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 release his nephew Lot. Thereafter, in biblical times, when Israel came, the tribe of Dan moved from the region of Gaza all the way up to this region to conquer the city of Laish. They renamed it Dan, and that became their city. They were not satisfied with the inheritance that they received from God, and they wanted another region. And if you remember the story, this is when they traveled up. Uh, they stole the personal priest of uh, Micah, uh, the Ephraimite, uh, and this personal priest who was a Levite by the name of Jonathan uh, came to Dan and he set up false altars there uh, to worship God. He became their personal priest. And we remember, if, if, if you do, that this uh, Jonathan the priest or Jonathan the Levite was actually the descendant of uh, Moses. And that's a very sad thing, right? Um, and, 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 and this was also the city where Jeroboam set up the second altar. Uh, he set up uh, the golden calf altar in north in Dan and the south in Bethel in order to uh, discourage the Jews from going all the way or discourage the Israelites in the divided monarchy period from going down to Jerusalem to worship. He would say, why bother? You know, we have uh, a convenient place here for you uh, to worship. And so Caesarea Philippi uh, was this place of uh, syncretism, of pagan emperor worship. And it was also a place that was called Panias, uh, being at the foothills of Mount Hermon. Uh, they had a cave there, which they called the gates of Hades, the gates of hell. It was reputed in those days uh, to be one of the entrances into the underworld. And that's where you had the god Pan. Uh, he was also worshipped in that region. And there would be uh, niches or groves in the uh, walls of the cliffs where uh, people would put images of, of nymphs uh, to be worshipped. So it was a really pagan area in which Jesus had brought the disciples. Now, this is a picture of uh, what we will see, right? Uh, I, I believe this is probably spring, right? The, the leaves on the trees are not there and the water is flowing from Mount Hermon coming down, uh, you know, to the city. This is the gate of hell. The gates of Hades is a cave, and these are the niches where uh, the, the false gods were worshipped. So it is at this place that Jesus uh, asks Peter and the rest of the disciples, you know, who do men say uh, that I am? So at, at this moment, uh, let's take a look at uh, Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Uh, 13 to 28. Now we see in verse 13, he asked his disciples when he brought them to the regions of Caesarea Philippi, uh, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And of course they said, oh, some say you're John the baptizer. Others say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And this is when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This confession, you know, even though the apostles were still shaky, they didn't know any, they didn't know everything yet. Uh, their knowledge had not come into maturity, but yet Peter, uh, having spent time with Christ, saw these things. And it was Jesus himself who said to him in verse 17, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. This is, this confession is a supernatural confession. You're only able to say this because the Father in heaven has revealed it to you. Then Jesus says something very interesting. 
in verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter Petros in Greek, all right? And upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, all right? And he goes on to say that I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you will loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. All right. So here uh, in the backdrop of this worldly uh, pagan religious city, Jesus asked this question and you see what so many other people had rejected the apostles affirmed, especially Peter. And this confession could only come from God. And so we, we want to see here the significance of this confession, all right? Uh, he confessed the primacy of Christ. He's the son of God. He is the Christ. And Jesus said on this confession, all right? will the kingdom grow? Not even hell can prevent its onward march. Not even the gates of hell. Gates of hell, you know, you have a gate and a fortress to protect something. So the kingdom is seen as an onward marching force, a force of war that goes forth from this confession by this gospel, all right? And uh, the, 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 the kingdom of Satan cannot prevent its onward march. So why did Jesus say some of these things? Well, in the backdrop of this city of man worship, of the greatness of man, of pagan religions, it is this simple confession, this gospel, right, uh, that will change the course of history, right? And we see in Matthew uh, 16 uh, that Jesus speaks about his death, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So how the kingdom will grow is the uh, preaching the, of this confession, who Jesus is and what he will do, right? And the growth of the kingdom is dependent, therefore, on his death. Now, this is where we come and we look at Peter and the disciples, and either we shake our heads or we give a face palm. On one hand, they articulate, you are the son of God, the Christ, you know, uh, and Jesus said on this confession, I will build my church. And then when he talked about his death, <laughs> Peter said, and we see in, um, in, in chapter 16, uh, verse 22, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. All right? And uh, Jesus said, you know, remarkably, in this backdrop, with the gates of hell behind, he says, Get behind me, Satan. All right? Uh, 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 thou art an offense unto me. Uh, thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. All right? So Peter was flip-flopping back and forth. But I think the wonderful thing that we can see here is uh, the, while you have the weakness of the apostles, and while you have the weakness of Peter, who would be the first one at Pentecost to preach this confession, right? Uh, we see the weakness of him. You know, on one hand, he confesses Christ, but then here, you know, he, he wavers. But Jesus said, on this confession will I build my church. Because Peter, you know, you are just Petros, but on this Petra, right, I will build my church. So when, we, when it comes to men, they are all weak. And, you know, here Jesus compares Petros with Petra. Petros, you know, was the Greek word that referred to a rock, a pebble, right? Uh, but he used the other 
uh, word upon this rock, upon this Petra, which is a uh, bedrock, a foundation rock. So, you know, it could have been that Jesus here picked up a stone and said, you know, you are Petros, but upon this Petra, right, the backdrop behind them of Mount Hermon, will I build uh, my church, All right? So Christ uses man. Christ does not depend on man, All right? Because man, they are not dependable, but it is the son of man that is dependable, All right? And, and so we, we, we see here this wonderful truth proclaimed uh, to his apostles. Uh, but after this proclamation, uh, Peter, uh, he wavered. And so this leads us by context uh, to the next event. So af after Matthew 16 is Matthew 17. And this is where Jesus took them to the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, we're not exactly sure where it is. Now, it could very well be that the Mount of Transfiguration was Mount Hermon. Some people have suggested that. Other people have suggested the traditional site of Mount Tabor. So this is the interesting mound uh, at the Vale of Jezreel that we will certainly be uh, passing by. Uh, if you recall, this was the mountain on which Barak and Deborah and all the troops of Israel were upon, uh, and God sent the rain so that the Kishon River, uh, it would rise up and there was lightning and all of Sisera's uh, uh, army uh, perished, you know, um, they were electrocuted. So it was either here or here, another place is Mount Arbel. We're really not sure what it was, but why did Jesus take these three apostles to this high mountain? Uh, I, you know, the other eight, oh, sorry, the other nine uh, apostles were not with them. We can only speculate why. Um, you know, James was the first to die. John uh, was the last to die. Uh, Peter was the one to preach the gospel first at Pentecost. Maybe that's why it was the three of them. Uh, or we could also say Jesus had his inner circle, his friends, the closest ones, the ones that he trusted in. So maybe that's why they, he took them up. But what they needed to see, uh, what they would witness, meaning the transfiguration, was what they needed to see in order to take them through uh, their ministry. So, of course, what was sad was... Uh, you know, Peter's denial uh, that Jesus would die. And so Jesus had to take him uh, to this mountain to reassure him and to teach him again uh, what really would happen, that he would have to trust uh, the words of Christ. You know, Christ has said, you know, uh, I will go to Jerusalem, I'll be tortured, I'll be killed, I'll be raised the third day. Peter said, you know, I, you know, that's not true. I'm not going to believe it. But on this mountain, when he finally saw Jesus in all, not all of his glory, but in the glory that he was able to behold him in, you know, then a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And I suppose what is important when we take a look at the transfiguration is um, the, let's see, uh, Okay, let, 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 me, let me just go through this slide first, is who was with Jesus, you know, at, um, at, the, at the transfiguration. Now, the transfiguration, uh, okay, let me just go to this side. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, okay. I'll go through this slide. So here we see that um, uh, in Matthew 17, Jesus was there with um, the, the prophets Elijah and Enoch, right? And here 
Peter and John and James saw how Christ's face was transfigured. He had this Shekinah glory of God. His face started to shine with pure light and his clothes also. Now, they were very impressed because Elijah was there. Uh, Moses were there. These were the two greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Moses was the one who came face to face with God. His face shone when he came down the mountain. Uh, Elijah was uh, the one who had schools for prophets, and he was taken up bodily into heaven. And so Peter, when he saw Christ there, he thought, wow, what a wonderful thing. My master is on the same level uh, with these two great prophets. So he failed to see that Christ was supreme. And uh, he had also failed to see that Christ was to die because what did he say when he saw uh, this great uh, transfiguration? He said, uh, shall we build three tents, you know, so that uh, Christ, Elijah, and Moses could stay there uh, forever. He wanted to preserve that moment when Christ himself had said that he needed to die. So after this happened, right, uh, when uh, God descended in a cloud and this cloud engulfed all of them, uh, this voice from heaven would dispel, would correct uh, Peter's wrong understanding. Uh, and he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So Elijah and uh, Moses, they were not sons. You know, they were only servants. They were only prophets. But Jesus is the very word of God. Right? He is God himself. And he should be listened to, kind of telling Peter that what Jesus said about his death and resurrection have to happen. So when they came down from the mountain, there was, you know, uh, quietness, there was contemplation. But what we see is that the apostles continued in carnality and the lack of faith. You know, all, all of this training of the 12 was meant for a specific reason. Uh, but it seemed as if they were not really getting it, right? Now, when they went down, right, the three of them went down uh, from the Mount of Transfiguration, they caught up with the other nine disciples. And these nine disciples were left behind to minister. You know, in, in Matthew uh, 18 and, and Luke 9, uh, we see that uh, they had tried to exorcise a demon, a father of this boy uh, went to them for help, but they could not exorcise the demon. And then subsequently, he went to Jesus and said, your disciples can't cure him. And this is where the, uh, Jesus rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. And this was sad, right? Uh, you know, why couldn't they exorcise the demon? And this reminds us, okay, I know there are Christians who say, oh, you're not healed because you had no faith. But Jesus clearly said, you know, uh, you know the boy was not healed because the healers had no faith, right? Uh, it was the, the faith healers that had no faith. That's why, you know, the, the, the boy was not cured. Now, why was this so significant? Because they had just been on uh, in Caesarea Philippi where they confessed Christ as the son of God, all right, the, the, the Christ, the, the son of the, the living God. But here they were not demonstrating the faith that would be, that should have been commensurate to that confession. And no doubt they were feeling rotten, all right? Now, the, the other three disciples who had come down from the mountain, Jesus charged them not to say anything, but no doubt, and we only see this implicitly from the text, not explicitly, that they were probably talking about being inside that inner circle, being the first of Christ's political kingdom. And this is when the other disciples, you know, they, they complained right, to Jesus about these others who were talking in this way. And 
it also shows us not just here why the disciples couldn't heal. They were slow to learn, even though they confessed who Christ was. But these three disciples, how could they talk like this? It's because also they were slow to learn. Jesus had already spoken about his suffering and death. God in that cloud had already told them, listen to my son, believe what he says. But here they were talking about who would be first. And so in this passage, Jesus used, uh, you know, the, a, a little child as an illustration that you should not see yourself as being great, right? And here he also taught about taxes, right? Uh, that they should not see themselves as uh, building kingdoms upon this earth. So we see here, uh, if you were Jesus, how, how would you be feeling at this moment, right? I think there would be a great amount of, you know, in, in his flesh, in the flesh as a human being, you know, Jesus uh, would have grieved when he saw all of these things. You know, there was intolerance of others. Uh, here, you know, John reported as they were ministering that there were some others who were casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and they were not part of the 12 apostles. And, you know, he probably said it with great indignation. And Jesus had to tell them, you know, who do you think you are, right? Who is not against you is for you, right? So there was this preeminence uh, that's, you know, common to all of us. Now, we see this intolerance also after the training of the 12. Uh, this does not happen at this stage, right? But uh, this is just a foretaste, right? Uh, we even see that uh, on their way to Jerusalem, when uh, Jesus got them to prepare the Samaritan villagers uh, ahead of time, um, and, and it was during this time that the Samaritan villagers did not want to receive Christ, very, very different from the first time that Jesus went through Samaria, and James and John being the sons of thunder, right, John already you know, <laughs> demonstrated it here, but again, in Samaria, he said, shall we call down fire to destroy them? And Jesus had to say, the Son of Man came not to destroy, but to save lives. We see that even though he had revealed that his kingdom was spiritual, that he would die, it, was, it would spread not by the sword, but by the gospel, they were still intolerant. They were intolerant amongst themselves. They were intolerant of others. And this is where Jesus said he would even leave the 99 for the one lost sheep, demonstrating that these Samaritan people who rejected him uh, were little ones, right? They were, they were the ones who needed the gospel. And so, you know, James and John should not have had this attitude. You know, I just want to pause here to say that even we Christians, right, we, we look at the, the apostles, you know, for three and a half years, they were so close to Jesus, but even to the very end, they were still arguing at the upper room who was going to be first, so much so that Jesus had to wash their feet. And, and this really speaks about who we are. Right? Why do we have so many problems as, as believers? You know, why do we sin against one another? Uh, because we do not fully understand uh, Christ's mission, uh, which was to love, to give his life, right? uh, to be obedient to his father. Right? And, uh, you know, if Jesus took such a long time to train his disciples, whom he was with every day, who saw him in the flesh, right? uh, albeit we have his spirit in us, right? It, it takes us a long time as well, and the Lord still has many things uh, to teach us. So not only did they have intolerance against uh, others, they had intolerance against each other, uh, and in Matthew 18, uh, that's when he had to teach his disciples. So along with the 12, there were other disciples who had followed. These were the remnant disciples, and one of them said, you know, to Jesus, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, my brother has done this to me, and you know, what should I do? Tell my brother to do this. And so Jesus had to teach the correct way of conflict resolution, because, you know, we being intolerant of one another in the flesh, 
uh, not according to his spirit. Uh, we will want to destroy others instead of restore others. So Jesus taught in Matthew uh, 18 that we don't handle it by gossip or by silence, but by confrontation uh, by the offended party. All right. So it's not, uh, you know, he did this to me. He should come to me. But rather, I'm offended. I need to go to the one who has offended me to, you know, to, to, to confront him and admonish him. And if he repents, then all is good because we forgive. But if there's no repentance, when there's clear sin, then there must be discipline by the assembly. You know, Jesus was talking about his kingdom and the spiritual kingdom, uh, what it should look like. Right? It should not merely be one of forgiveness, uh, but it should be one of restoration. And if uh, people uh, refuse to repent, which is the characteristic of the Christian, right, poor in spirit, mourn, uh, 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 who are meek, who are peacemakers, who suffer for righteousness sake, you know, then there is a need to exercise discipline in his kingdom. And so this is when Peter gave the example. He thought he was very forgiving. He says, if my brother sins against me, shall I forgive him even until seven times? Because the uh, Pharisees had taught three strikes and you're out, right? So you can forgive up to four times, but after that, you don't need to forgive anymore. So Peter must have thought he was very forgiving by saying seven. And Jesus told the parable of the unmerciful servant and said that if we are to forgive as God forgives, it must be limitless, you know, when there is uh, repentance. And of course, when there's no repentance, we are to forbear with one another. Because ultimately, if you're in the spiritual kingdom of God and you're part of his people, forgiveness is a mark of being forgiven, whereas unforgiveness is a mark of those who have not been uh, forgiven. So here, Jesus was dealing with this uh, intolerance of one another. He was training them and teaching them. And also, you know, he, uh, during this period of time, he was talking to them about the commitment that they needed. You know, on the road to Jerusalem, as they neared, uh, there were some in the wider circle of disciples who were unwilling to follow Jesus. If you recall, uh, the, and this is subsequently, uh, there was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus who would not give up all that he had. And, and some of them, they were leaving uh, uh, you know, Jesus behind. Right? And, and here, as they left Galilee, as they neared to Jerusalem, um, they were leaving their homes and their lives behind, and some of them were not so sure. And this is where Jesus spoke about the cost of following uh, him. Uh, it may be poverty, it may be discomfort. You know, there was one who wanted to wait until his father was dead, uh, meaning wait to bury his father, you know, wait until his obligations uh, were over before he followed Christ. And Jesus, of course, in uh, giving these words, uh, indirectly rebuked him, right? Because only the dead delay in following me. So if you are to follow the kingdom of God, it must be now. So here Jesus was uh, in the training of the 12, laying down a lot of hard things because he knew the road ahead for them would be hard. So I guess the question is, was the training of the 12 successful, you know? Uh, and in one sense, you could say, in man's eyes, you know, not the most successful. But remember that Jesus is in control of all things. He needed to be betrayed. He needed to be alone. His disciples needed to flee from him, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, all of these things. So uh, despite his teaching them, uh, and he was a masterful teacher, it, in the end, they were not, they, 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 were, they were not all that well, they, they did not receive and believe everything that he said at that moment. And so you, 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 you must look at this, um, ministry of Jesus from 
the standpoint of eternity, how it fulfilled what Jesus was going to do. And it was a training ground for his disciples. Uh, and it taught them discipleship. They, they knew how far they had fallen and therefore how much they owed to Christ. And you must imagine that this was a very difficult time for Jesus, you know, with the unbelief in Galilee, the rejection by the Pharisees, you know, the Samaritans, the first time around, they were very happy to receive him, but now they were not happy. Uh, the disciples also, you know, they flip-flopped, and there were many who, who went back home to Galilee. They stopped following him. So his descent geographically to Judea pictured his, quote-unquote, failure. And as he went up geographically to, topographically to Jerusalem, you know, really showed his increasing grief. And that is why, you know, as the Bible says, he was a man of sorrows, right? Because he is the one who would bear all our griefs. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop here. The next time we'll look at uh, his later Perean and Judean ministry.